Mr. Maynard, really, and truly, thank you for doing this with us. First of all, I would like to know what does DL stand for, and have you been called that all your life? Oh, yes. But what it stands for is, it stands for darn lucky. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, now, I'll tell you the truth. Uh, it stands for Doris Leon. Doris Leon. Okay. Doris Leon. <laughs> okay. And where were you born? I was born and raised in Iraq. And your family? In the year 1932. 32. I think 32. And you have uh, six children, right? Nope. I have seven children. Oh, okay. But I have six boys. That's what you met most probably. Six, have six boys, boys and one girl. And one girl. And how many of them are in music? Well, there's four of them that play music, uh, that plays the guitar. Uh, and uh, well, there's two of them that plays guitar and bass. Lyra plays guitar, fiddle, and bass, and more or less whatever. He feels like playing, he plays it. Uh, he, when he was at, well, he's the one that started uh, that group called Atrapalaya. And uh, he told me one day, he said, Daddy, said, I think we need a fiddle player in our group. I, he said, I think I'm going to learn how to play the fiddle. I said, you will, huh? Well, I said, good luck. And uh, I'll be down if he didn't learn. He'd come and visit over here, he'd bring a conversation and make his skill on the fiddle. His wife and uh, my wife would go to the grocery store. He'd, he'd ask, Mama, can I go? Yeah, Larry, you can come. Well, play fiddle all the way to the grocery store and all the way back. He wouldn't get down to the grocery store. He stayed in the car. And I'd be done if he didn't learn. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever he wanted to do, he done it. That's I wish I could be like that. So what I can't even hold it properly, me. And that instrument except the guitar. <laughs> so that's the only... <laughs> that's the only one that can play a different uh, instrument. All the others is the guitar that, that they play. And the same. Did you teach them how to play guitar, or did they no, just naturally pick it up? No, I couldn't teach them nothing. As far as Larry, uh, I didn't know he was playing my guitar, you know. And, uh, but, uh, the well of you. Well, he was kind of young, and I had a guitar the best that Gibson company made. It was a J200 Gibson, and uh, it was a... Uh, but excuse me. You could lean back. Oh, lean back again? Lean down of the lights. Uh, oh, <laughs> that's right. Yeah, that's a uh, hot <laughs> nugget. Okay. I'm well, sorry Larry, to interrupt. Larry picked up a guitar and you didn't know he was playing it? No, but what, what happened, uh, Luella would sit, would sit him down in the middle of the bed with the guitar. And uh, I didn't even taught him a key. But we had a practice with the group over here with the Louisiana Aces. Every Wednesday night, that was a practice. From the only time we wouldn't practice was in length. That was out. Well, he'd watch me, and he he learned, he learned just by watching. That's so until yeah. one day I come over here, well, he had my guitar over there. Do what he tells me. Listen, he's got your guitar. Well, I listen a while. I said, Larry, say, come, bring it to me. I said, I'll tune it for you. Hot dog, didn't really, well, it made him feel good. Well, he brought me the guitar. He had it tuned better than I ever could tune a guitar, so I'll give it back to him. Say, have fun. And uh, he was making some keys. He was making some chord that he needed. I asked him, what key was that? He said, I don't know. Well, I said, how do you know what to do? Well, he said, I got to find my sound. This is the sound I need. And he said, you just push your finger until you get your sound. When he, he started playing with a chapel eye, that's when he found out what was the key, and he had it, he had it right. <laughs> he made his own key, and he had it right. That was the way to do it. And how did you get started? How that started, I tell you, it was a, more or less a, <laughs> more or less a mistake. It's a, we had quit farming, we had moved to town, and I was 16 and a half years old. I had never heard my live Cajun band before. 
And I had a knock on that had a Cajun group. I had never heard of him. Where his player was too far, I couldn't go there. And one night, they had a practice. I went to the practice session. Oh, yeah, yeah, I fell in love with that guitar, Jack. And uh, after the practice session, I asked him if he uh, was going to teach me how to play the guitar. No problem. He taught me. Well, in, uh, I was determined. He teach me two or uh, three keys. I'd learn them right away. And, uh, but then that guitar wasn't good enough. I had uh, the first guitar I had. Well, to start with, after the practice session, I got, I got home. I got me a Montgomery Ward catalog, and it was, it was almost ten o'clock. Started looking in. Well, Daddy was watching me. He wouldn't say nothing until after a while. He, he asked me, he said, "What you doing?" I said, "I want to order myself a guitar." <laughs> well, he said, "I'll be done." He said, but that's a hell of a thing. He said, you can't keep no money. Huh? He said, just burn you in your pocket. He said, you got to spend that money. Huh? Oh, yeah. But uh, I couldn't afford the one I wanted it. I had to get the cheapest. And posted, postage paid. It got to the Iraq post office. It cost me an even $11 at guitar. <laughs> but the string was pretty high over the freight. And, uh, well, in no time, that guitar wasn't good no more. Well, I started looking at the Sizzle Buck catalog. Well, they had one in there, a beautiful guitar in there, but that one there was $45. Well, I couldn't afford that one, so I had to take the next one, twenty-four ninety-five, with the case. It was a pretty good guitar. Well... When the guitar came in at the post office, now I didn't know any better, but I thought sure that's how it would have been, you know. When it got to the post office, I opened up the case. They had made a mistake. They had put the forty-five dollar one in there, and believe it or not, uh, <laughs> what was the old man? The, uh, Clement, Mr. Clement, was still there at the post office in that little window. Well, when I opened that box, when I seen what kind of guitar I had, I hurried up and closed the box. And, and, and I, I ran home in town because I was afraid if Mr. Clement would have seen that guitar, he'd have made me return. <laughs> that, that's how it was. That, 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 that's how I was thinking. Believe it or not, it's funny, but it's the truth. If I tell y'all any different, I'd be lying to y'all. I hurry up and closed the box, boy, and took off. <laughs> when I got over there, oh yeah, six months after I had bought my first guitar, I played my first dance job, and it was at Palomo's nightclub in Abbeville. And I've been playing ever since. And how old were you at that time, about 17? 19 years old. 19. Uh, excuse me, 17. 17? Okay, how old? I was, go I was going ahead of myself there. If you pause in between questions. Oh, okay. And how old were you when you first played? Seventeen years old. I bought my first guitar at sixteen and a half. And six months after, I played my first dance job. I was determined to learn, and I learned. <laughs> now they think I'm good. I'm going all over the place, and I don't tell them any better. <laughs> so it's, that's how I get to go, you know. <laughs> Who was it's that? It's true. <laughs> Who were um, some of your music idols besides oh, yeah, your yeah, uncle? Hank Williams was my, the, the best one. He's, it, it, as a matter of fact, he's the cause of me being on stage today. Uh, that's why I learned how to play the guitar, to sing his song. I was singing his song long before I ever learned how to play the guitar. And uh, in 1951, I got to meet him. I got to talk to him for about 10 minutes at the Tech Club in the Abbey. That's where all the Grand Ole Opera stars would come, you know, and uh, I stayed with him there from uh, 9 o'clock at night till uh, 15 to 1 in the morning. And uh, I learned a lot from him. And But at that particular time, I didn't know what he was telling. He was telling it to me, but I, I couldn't visualize what he, what he meant. 
And I went, when I started traveling, every once in a while, I see something, something happens to me that I remember what he told me. Every time I leave, I remember that man, what he told me that night. We talked, we was able to talk silent for about 10 minutes when I noticed they had a bunch of people uh, surrounding us and uh, their heads were going back and forth. I'd ask him a question, he'd answer it, and back and forth. And when I noticed all the people that there was around us, I told him, I said, Hank, I said, I better talk to you later. I said, there's some more people that wants to talk to you. And I said, uh, we, I said, we're going pretty good. But I said, I better talk. Oh, yeah, I said, we'll talk to each other later. And uh, I still have my autograph picture of him that he autographed that night. And uh, when we recorded, when I recorded that country album of mine, that was in uh, 88, I believe, something like that. Uh, 87 or 88, something like that. Well, on half of the album, we used his musician, the fiddle player and the steel player. And the wise backed up the whole album, and uh, Ricky Skag had time to play on only two of them. But Hank William is the one that influenced me to, to play music. Uh, that's one of the reasons why I bought a guitar. And I sang his song three years before I started singing Cajun song. As a matter of fact, I told him that night that uh, we play in a Cajun group, we play all his songs, and I was the one that was singing him. Oh, that made me... I was proud to tell him that. So you played country music before you got into Cajun music? Uh-uh, uh-uh. It was Cajun music. But we had to play country song. Our Cajun music had kind of died out at one point. And most people was ashamed. It came to a point that they were ashamed that they were Cajun, you know. And uh, country and Western had took over. And uh, a, a Cajun band that could not play a country song, they were almost not considered a band. That was a back porch musician that just practiced musician. Uh, we had to play a country song because it was requested. And especially Hank William, he was the most popular one at that particular time. All the Cajun group had to play his song because it was requested. And if you couldn't play what the people wanted, well, you didn't have a job too long. The owner of the club would fire you. <laughs> And us, we'd get on stage on the bandstand. We had to be on that bandstand the 15 minutes before we started to make sure everything was in tune. And we had to start at, if we had to start at 8, well, don't start too many times at 2 or 3 minutes after 8. <laughs> you, you, you was going to hear about it. <laughs> you had to start at us, we had to tune with the garden. And that night was the most remarkable thing that I had seen. It, that is still in my mind, it's still, it's still in my mind, and I'll never forget it. They all tuned the instrument individually. Jerry Rivers was right in front of me, he tuned his fiddle, Don Ham tuned his uh, steel guitar, and set his amplifier. There was no sound, there was no sound check, nothing. And Hank Ham, he came to the so the mic started talking to the people and tuning his open bass guitar at the same time. I was watching him, I said, my God, how in the hell can he hear? Talking at the same time, tuning his guitar. And they were just waiting. Well, I said to myself, well, I'll be done. So they won't tune up, no. And uh, after a while, Hank turns on, he said, are we ready? One of them said, yeah, we are. Okay, he said, here's our first song for tonight, which I don't remember what it was. Everything was in tune, believe you me, and they were set perfect. They had a better sound to me on that stage than they had on record. It was like a machine that was on that stage. It was unbelievable. That was the only time that I 
I got to hear him. That was the only time I met him. And I got to talk to him. After that, that was in 1951. That that was right after the Hadakal caravan of uh, Cousadur, what we call Dudley the Jellybone. He had a mm -hmm. bat medicine. And uh, Hank was on that that caravan. But after that, he came uh, to the test club, just played a regular dance job, and he mingled with the people in the dance hall just like an ordinary person. And now a country star uh, has got to disguise himself, or uh, he, he, he can't go out too much because the, 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 the people is going to leave him with, without no clothes <laughs> if he don't wash himself. <laughs> it's, it's not at all like it used to be, I tell you. Just like when you go out now, right? That, oh, i got to watch myself all the time. Oh, yeah. Especially in Iraq, right? Especially in Iraq. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Get those groupies following you around? Oh, man. <laughs> i got to fight them off. <laughs> yeah. Tell us about some of the countries that you've been to and some uh, of the favorites. Some of the countries I've been to, it's, uh, I tell you, uh, I have enjoyed, I've never been to a country yet that I have not enjoyed. The only thing, some countries are different than the others. The one that uh, almost impressed me the most, it was uh, Asia. And uh, China was one of the Shetland Islands. And last February, Rome, Italy. That's the three of them that was... That stayed on my mind the most because it was so much different than the other countries that I have been. And I have now been to my 33rd country. Uh, I know a little bit about countries, uh, <laughs> but uh, some of them I didn't stay long enough to, to be well educated about the country. Sometimes uh, it was more or less what I call a hit and run. We'd play a concert in that country, and then we, the next night was in another one. Uh, when you travel, uh, one night stand, uh, most of the time, that's how it is. <laughs> um, tell us about some of the Hall of Fame awards and honors that you've won. And I know you went to the Grammys one year, didn't yes, you? Yes, I was nominated. Uh, that was a, a fun deal. Uh, It's, uh, I had never been to one. Just a matter of fact, I didn't want to go to one. Uh, my wife, Luella, made me go. Uh, instead of getting a divorce, I'd rather go to the Grammy. <laughs> no, that's not how it was at all. Uh, a friend of mine, Warren Perrin, he's a lawyer in Lafayette, uh, he wanted to go. And I didn't want to go by myself. I don't like, uh, well, first of all, I, uh, I didn't want to be in too much high class stuff. Uh, of course, I'll tell you what, now I'm glad I did because it was an experience. Is the, what you don't see on television as the rearranging of the stage. Now, to me, the rearranging of the stage is more interesting than the performance. You should see, and everybody's got their job. You, sw you, you swear it's like little ants on a hill on that stage. You can't imagine what those people go through. That's why it's not just anybody that can do it. But it's the rearranging of the stage. It's, it, it, it's unbelievable. So tell me about some of the awards that you have won. Oh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> to, tell <you> the, <laughs> to tell you the truth, I got the uh, Big Easy Award. Uh, I got some award from El Paso. I got some award from the Times and all kinds of certificates. Uh, which I can't tell you every one of them because I've been uh, now people might think so but it's not there's nothing wrong with my memory the only thing sometimes it's kind of short 
but uh, it's a. Uh, the whole thing, they think uh, the people uh, think I deserve it. They vote for me. Yeah, I'm in the Country Music Hall of Fame in Nashville, uh, and the Cajun exhibit, uh, and I had some pictures. Me and Jimmy C. Newman went and performed over there when they opened up the Cajun exhibit. Uh, that's the closest I got to the Grand Ole Opera, a plane. But we went twice at the Grand Ole Opera, and one time, when Ricky Skaggs started playing, we went in the audience. We was always backstage. On that railing in the, in the back, that's where we was at, me and Luella. Uh, but uh, it's an honor to be in there with, like we say, with all the big boys, you know. But uh, they have a Cajun exhibit right in the middle of the museum. And uh, me and a few other Cajun is in there. That's wonderful. So, uh, That's wonderful. It makes you feel good. <laughs> oh, and it's well deserved, of well, course. Well, yeah, oh, it's well preserved. And well deserved. And well deserved, yeah, because, uh, like, uh, I do it natural, and do it, I do it like I've always been doing it. And uh, like uh, most Cajun music musician has got to say that we have paid our dues to get up there. Uh, we've been in the business for a heck of a long time. Uh, <laughs> there is now just about 44 years that I'm playing music. So, uh, <laughs> I've, uh, I've spent many nights up. And how long do you plan to keep playing? Uh, I keep, I plan to keep playing as long as I can. Uh, if I can live until I die, I'll, I'll still be playing. <laughs> uh. um, tell me about, do you have any um, most memorable performances or what was one of your most famous performances? Or to tell you the truth, uh, the, the most uh, memorable, memorable performance was in the Shetland Island is the country music of the 50s over there. And they had a band from art. It was a week, a whole week of festival. That festival lasted the whole week. And uh, I had to go in the back of a five-piece band every night and close the show with Hank Williams' song. They claimed the music of today is so progressive they claim they can't understand it. They like that natural stuff. And boy did they love Hank William over there. That's between Norway and Scotland. And one night we went on the third island. We had to cross the cross both ferries. On the big island that we was on was uh, 75 miles long and 18 miles wide. The others is at least half of that. I don't know how big they are, but uh, we had to cross both ferries. And we spent the night that night. And uh, going over there in the bus, uh, this guy, a uh, director, a uh, producer, the one that was in charge of the, the festival, came with us, and he was telling me, you know, and uh, they don't like to be the island belong to Scotland now. Well, uh, Norway gave the Shetland Island to Scotland and they don't like to be called uh, Scottish for some reason. They, they don't like to be called Scottish. And uh, I like to do that every once in a while, you know. Uh, I get on stage after I had sang my first song, I said, this is a privilege and an honor for me to be here because I never thought I was going to get here that far. I said, believe it or not, 
I said, before I leave here, I said, I will tell Santa Claus what to bring me. <laughs> because it was very up north, you know. And I said, uh, I don't know what y'all call yourself. If it's, I said, y'all must be Norwegian, huh? Well, after that, I had it made. It, it, I couldn't do no wrong. <laughs> so I, I like to do that every once in a while, you know, to, to check out the people. <laughs> uh, but, and, not only that, uh, the most memorable, uh, another time, uh, was in Thailand. The State Department had rent, had chartered a plane. It was a DC-9 prop plane, but we had uh, our own sound equipment. Uh, we were the only one on board. They had took uh, a bunch of seats out in the middle of the plane, and they had put that equipment, and was the only one. And uh, that night, the pilot and the co-pilot and the two stewards that was on that plane with us, that was taken care of, uh, had came to the concert. And every night, I sang a Hank Williams song. That's, that's every night. Because uh, I always felt like I owned that for me, being on stage, you know. And I had sang a Hank Williams song. And while they were loading the plane, we was at the airport, and they wanted the stewards to come to me. And she asked me, she said, are you Hank Williams? And uh, I said, no, I'm not Hank Williams. I said, Hank Williams is dead. And I just went, and she said, yeah. And she just walked away. Then I, I noticed she was serious, you know. So we got to where we were going. They came and got us. We went in the, they brought us in the country. And they fed us uh, rice and gravy. Just almost identical like over here. And uh, I called her. I said, come sit down right there. I said, real and, and true. I said, you, did, you didn't know Hank Williams had died? Well, I said, she said, nobody knew that Hank Williams had died. Nobody knows Hank Williams died. She said, we know his music. <laughs> That's how she said. We know he, she could speak uh, very little English, uh, more or less like me, you know, broken English. She said, uh, we know his music, but we didn't know his he had died, and uh, but really and truly, she thought I was saying, uh, at first I thought it was a, just a joke, but then I seen she was serious. That's the one time that uh, I remember. But there's a whole bunch of stuff that I have forgot uh, that happened to me on tour, that had, uh, especially when it was in the, uh, uh, <laughs> our keeper Peru when you got to the airport the guard came and surrounded us with a machine gun and uh, <laughs> take us two by two and go in the room and search us uh, we didn't know what they would then after all said okay y'all can go just like that we went on the plane we boarded the plane and flew away <laughs> oh yeah <coughs> What's you the just, just never know different countries what they're looking for uh, mm. uh, they never told us <laughs> um, what's the largest group or crowd you've ever played to 15,000 people wow. and that was in Arequipa, Peru at the at the arena it was a close end uh it was the, uh, more or less uh, but it was at least as big as the Cajun gong or maybe possibly bigger but they had a big book festival there and believe it or not there was about 15,000 outside waiting to come in I had never, I, I didn't know they had that much people in the world even. <laughs> and but you talk about some people. And uh, <clears throat> what we done, we didn't have no application. So we play acoustic. Well, around, around the arena. We play music and sing and keep on 
round and round. Now that was an experience. That, 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 <laughs> that the, the first time I had done it, and that was the only time. This is my fact. Question. Mr. Manuel, could I ask you, the, the light from the sun is our main light coming through that window, uh -huh. and because the sun's starting to go down a little bit, it's, it's gotten in a narrower spot, and when you rock back and forth, you rock it in oh. <laughs> So I, I hate to inconvenience you. What did that? In fact, I think I might try to move the camera a little bit. Uh, no, just don't move the camera, move the car. It, it, the, light, the wind shield that's knocking uh, straight it's in the face. Okay. <laughs> go, go. Which one is it? Ready? Um, just a few more questions. One of them is, tell us about your hat. About my hat. I tell you what, uh, it, it, it just happened that way. It, now, if I don't wear my hat, it's just like people hadn't seen me. And uh, the reason why I started wearing that hat, I had a cold that I could not get rid of. It would stay with me year round. And uh, my wife told me to start wearing the hat that it was good. And I did, and the cold went away. And uh, <laughs> I've been wearing it ever since. Mm -hmm. Well, I wear it too. <laughs> um, and of course, we all want to know the story behind the famous song, The Back Door. Oh, yeah, yeah. Everybody, every once in a while, uh, people ask me about that. They think that uh, the reason why a lot of, the, the, not all of them, but some of them, the reason why they ask me that is because they think I had to go through the back door one time. <laughs> uh, that's why they ask me that, you know. But it's not, it's not so. Uh, it, it just came to me from experience and uh, from uh, every day of life went through all the honky tonk, came back late at night, uh, the day was starting to break, we went through the back door, that afternoon we went to town, got in trouble, my friends brought me back home, they had some strange company at the house, so we went through the back door, the following afternoon, went back to town, this time I got drunk, I got in trouble, the law picked me up, <laughs> they brought me to jail, but we went through the back door. Okay. So then. <laughs> well, would you sing part of that song or the song for oh, us? Uh, sure. Oh, we would love to hear uh, that. Let me ask you a question before you wrap it up. Now imagine that school children are watching it. And mm -hmm. part of the program is to teach them about Cajun culture and Cajun heritage and why it's important to keep that alive. What would you say to those kids? Why it's important to keep that alive? Because it's, a, it's our way of life. Is the the way we live, the way we work, what we, it's our culture, food, and our music, and the work that we do, we're the only one that does that in the world. And it's better to learn as much as you possibly can about our culture in the South because you never know when you're going to grow up, how much is going to be become popular and how much you'll be able to do it. You'll never know when you'll be able to use what you learned right. today and the years to come. Because 25 years ago, if somebody would have told me that today I would have been to 33 countries, I'd have never believed them. You never know what the future holds. Learn as much as you pops possibly can. If you don't get to use it, that's something that nobody can take away from you. You have learned it. If it comes a time where you'll have to use it, you know how to use it. You'll be able to use it. You'll be able to speak French. Cajun music, unless you speak French, you can't play the, you can't sing the Cajun song. So, there you go. How do you think the, the music has affected Cajun culture? Uh, the music, uh, it's just, it, it just like a cooking. Uh, used to, in, uh, let's say, 30, 40 years ago, 
Samba was kind of ashamed to play our music because it was considered a low class music. But the Cajun didn't know what they had, and the people around the Cajun country didn't know what the Cajun had. It took a scout from up north, far from folk festival, that came and found out what kind of music we had. We didn't know it was a unique sound, unique sound we had, and it is a unique sound. Uh, the accordion. The Cajun music, that's the only place you can find that is the southwestern part of Louisiana. And I'll tell you what, uh, when I, asked, I had asked Hank William how long it took him to write a song, he told me if it took more than a half an hour, that meant he couldn't write it. He put it aside. And he said, remember when you're going to start recording, and that's when I told him, I said, Hank, I'll never record me. It's French music we're playing. I said, it's almost not, not some music to put in record. He said, it's yours. Well, I said, that's the music we grew up with. Well, he said, if it's your music, it's good music. He said, there's not any kind of music that I would listen to continuously. But he said, if, you, if it's your music, no matter what kind of music it is, he said, some good music. He said, different countries got different music. That don't mean that their music is not good, just as good as the other country. Every country, every place got his own style of music to play, and he said, everyone is good. And that's the Cajun music uh, is good. It's, it's helping the kids now, I think, to learn how to speak French because a lot of wants to play Cajun music and unless they can speak French, pronounce the word, well, they cannot sing Cajun song. Did you play a couple songs for us? Wow, well, yeah. sure. Yeah. Oh, question real quick. Oh, let me just change the angle. Okay. Okay. Yeah. 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 I'm just curious, how does Cajun music make you feel? Well, I tell you what, uh, It makes me feel like I'm alive because I always, I always did love music, but uh, I'm beginning to, when I started traveling, that's when I really got to love Cajun music uh, because of what Cajun music was doing for me. Uh, is because of the music that I got to see the different countries in the world. Uh, I've toured the United States, uh, back and forth uh, within 43 states repeatedly. And uh, I just love Cajun music. And on top of that, I love to hear myself sing. <laughs> <laughs>